This is the eighth in a series of lectures giving an introduction to exterior differential system. In this lecture, we want to understand Cartan's uh, test more clearly. Cartan's um, the test or the Cartan Kaler theorem has this kind of predicted dimension in it. And we want to understand why is there a predicted dimension? Why should that be the prediction? We want to see it in a kind of geometric way, coming out naturally from thinking about the characters of, of, a, of an exterior differential system. So we want to understand what involution is. Why is it this strange statement about predicted dimension? What does that have to do with there being some integral manifolds? And uh, we, specifically, we'd like to come up with this number. This is the predicted dimension. We'd really like that to pop out naturally from some kind of simple geometric description. Now, to do that, we have to think about integral manifolds and how they sit inside some larger manifold of all possible linear subspaces. We have to think about the equations on them. And so we'll need to think about something called the Grassmann bundle. The P Grassmann bundle is just the set of all p-dimensional linear subspaces of tangent spaces of a manifold M. So uh, that's the obvious thing to think about because integral elements will be p-dimensional linear subspaces, so they'll sit among all the p-dimensional linear subspaces. This is a manifold, this P Grassmann bundle. It's just something I leave you to, to, to consider and try and figure out how to write out some kind of um, coordinates on it in some reasonably natural way. Um, now, we also have to worry about generic, about the notion of something being generically true. And so we need to have make sense out of the idea of genericity. What does it mean if I say the generic point of a manifold has a particular property? Um, what I mean is simply that the points with that property form an open and everywhere dense subset. Okay, so the, when I say the generic point of a manifold has a certain property, I mean that the points with that property form an open everywhere dense subset. That'll be sufficient for our purposes as a definition of generic for what we want to do. When I talk about the generic submanifold having a particular property, it's a bit more difficult. What I mean is something about uh, about the the tangent spaces of that submanifold. So what I mean when I say the generic submanifold has a certain property is that there's some open, everywhere dense subset of the Grassmann bundle so that those submanifolds whose tangent spaces lie in that subset have that property. Okay, so that would be the, the definition of generic for submanifolds rather than points. It really is just about uh, their, their pro the properties of their tangent spaces, that they have generic tangent spaces in some sense. Okay, so now we want to follow Cartan's strategy. How does he construct integral manifolds of an exterior differential system? He first starts by drawing a point, which could be any point. And he then draws an integral curve somehow through that point. And we'll worry later about how exactly do we construct integral curves through a given point. But for the moment, let's just uh, say that somehow he constructs an integral curve through that point and an integral surface through that curve and so on and so forth all the way up until he reaches his p-dimensional integral manifolds. We assume always, of course, that there's some dimension p, which we always write as p, uh, which is the dimension for which we're interested in really constructing the integral manifolds. But we're going to do it step at a time, dimension at a time, starting with a point, then a curve, then a surface, and so on and so forth. We'll fail in trying to do this unless the integral curve is extendable. What I mean by extendable is simply that it should lie in an integral surface. And it's possible that some integral curves don't lie in any integral surface. And that then we'd be in trouble, then we'd fail. But we're not going to worry too much about every integral curve. We're only going to worry about the generic integral curve. That's a slightly more trickier notion of generic, of course, because it has to be generic among integral curves. In other words, its tangent spaces form a dense open subset of the collection of possible integral elements. But nevertheless, ignoring the, the, the technical points, roughly speaking, we want to imagine that uh, we'll only worry about constructing the generic integral curve, generic integral, integral surface, and so on. So we don't really care about the extendability of all the integral curves. What we want to know is, is the generic integral curve extendable? And the generic integral surface, and so on and so forth. And if it's not, then we're going to be in trouble, and this isn't going to work. So let's start again. Draw a point.
But now instead of drawing an integral curve through the point, I'm just going to draw an integral line in the tangent space at that point. So in other words, I'm really trying to do the infinitesimal analog, I'm carrying out the infinitesimal uh, uh, version of the previous picture. So now we've drawn an integral line in the tangent space at that point. We draw an integral plane through that integral line, and so on and so forth. And again, we'll end when we hit a p-dimensional integral element. We'll fail to do this unless the integral line is extendable, that is to say, lies in some integral plane, and so on and so forth. But again, we won't try and draw all the integral lines, integral planes, and so on. We'll only try and draw the generic one. Now, it's clear that this kind of strategy is much easier to follow. This is just linear algebra. At each step, we're not doing anything about differential equations. To construct integral lines, integral planes, and so on, all the way up to p-dimensional integral elements, you just have to do linear algebra. And if you can't solve those linear algebra problems, then you would run into trouble. But we can tell whether or not linear algebra problems are solvable by simple linear algebra techniques. We don't need to do anything about differential equations. So this is an easy thing to check. But it's also clear that if we can't do this, then we can't do the previous, uh, the previous slides Carton strategy. The strategy for drawing integral manifolds is going to fail unless the strategy for drawing integral elements uh, succeeds. So what this, this is where we'll start. Let's just see if we can somehow use this kind of uh, technique to be able to draw integral elements step by step, dimension by dimension, extending, at least generically extending them. Is the generic integral line extendable? So we want to think about the extendability problem. And, um, and because we're only interested in generic, we can, we can throw away most of the, uh, uh, the, the integral elements satisfying some equation. Um, so a zero-dimensional integral element was said to be regular if its polar equations have locally maximal rank. And of course, that'll be a, um, a generic condition. Now we're going to use an inductive definition of regularity from here on. An integral element is said to be ordinary if it has a regular hyperplane. And we assume by induction that we've already defined what a regular hyperplane is. In other words, a lower dimensional in integral element um, being regular. But it's uh, then, then an ordinary integral element is said to be regular if it also, if it also has uh, polar equations of locally maximal rank. OK, so what we're going to be studying is, is this notion of regularity and ordinarity. And it's intuitively clear that this really has a lot to do with, with the previous notion of, of this generic extendability, because we want to make sure that we're studying the the uh, generic polar, generically paid polar equations, and then we want to make sure that at each step we don't run into any kind of problem with generically uh, trying to extend. But the extending requires us to, to, to count polar equations to see whether or not we have an extension. Okay, so this is not surprisingly closely related to the issue of, of having um, of having some kind of, of, of uh, Carton strategy for integral elements. And here's a different description of Carton's test. Involutivity is precisely ordinarity. This is um, saying, in other words, that the notion of involution we had before, that the integral elements have the predicted dimension, occurs exactly uh, for the ordinary integral elements, those which have a regular hyperplane. OK, so that's not obvious. We'll give a proof of at least uh, we'll give a proof of half of this uh, and leave the rest for you to fill in the details yourself. As a corollary of, of this theorem, before we give a proof of it, um, we can see that among the integral elements, either none are involutive or the generic ones are involutive, at least among, let's say, to be more precise, among path components, let's say, of integral elements, either none of them are involutive or the generic ones are involutive, because that's clear for ordinarity that ordinarity really has to do with having these rank conditions, and the rank conditions will continue to be satisfied So, uh, nearby. So this is, this is um, uh, giving us an intuitive notion of, of involutivity, because ordinary is more intuitive. It really has to do with holding on to ranks of polar equations. OK, let's think about what is the relationship between polar equations and integral elements uh, varying somehow in a space of integral elements. If we write down a particular 
uh, differential form, say theta, from our from our exterior differential system, we can see that it should impose an equation theta is zero on integral elements, which is an equation on the Grassmann bundle. And as I said before, I leave it to you to work out uh, some some description of local coordinates on the Grassmann bundle, which of course is done in the lecture notes. So once you write out uh, in coordinates what theta is zero looks like as an equation on the Grassmann bundle, and whenever you have an equation, you should always differentiate it, and you'll differentiate it, and you find that in fact uh, you can write each polar equation as in some sense a differential of the equation theta is zero. I'll leave you to, 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 to make sense out of that statement. You can check, you can differentiate in coordinates the equation theta is zero and see that this somehow gives rise to polar equations. So I'll leave you to check that. And so these, this ranks of polar equations issue is really all about uh, constructing um, uh, variations within the Grassmann bundle, trying to move integral elements. So let's suppose we pick an ordinary integral element, call it EP, so p-dimensional. Now we want to try to figure out how the hell the characters relate to uh, this ordinarity. Um, and we said ordinarity was defined to be having a regular hyperplane, uh, which is, is itself therefore ordinary and has a regular hyperplane in it, and so on and so forth. So we can go all the way down with all this regularity. So we pick an ordinary integral element EP, and then let's pick generically chosen p minus 1 linear equations in coordinates. And they will cut out a line in that EP. Because it's p-dimensional, we've imposed p minus 1 equations, so there's a one-dimensional space of solutions. But they'll also cut out a line in all the nearby p-planes. Whether they're integral p-planes or not, just look at all p-planes nearby. When you impose p minus 1 linear equations on them, we assume those equations are defined everywhere nearby um, and remain independent nearby, then they'll cut out a line in all the nearby p-planes. So that's how we can describe a line as the solution of those equations. But is that line integral? It'll be integral when it satisfies the s naught equations that are required to uh, the polar equations on the origin. So they're s naught equations to make that line integral. So typically those lines will not be integral lines, but if they satisfy those s naught equations, they will. Okay, so now let's pick a different set, a gene still generically chosen set of p minus 1 linear equations. We've chosen linear equations essentially sort of at random, and they'll cut out a different line in every p-plane, at least nearby, nearby our EP. So we've got uh, one set, our first set of p minus 1 linear equations cutting out one line. We've got a different set of p minus 1 linear equations. They cut out a different line in each p-plane. Let's see if we can add the line from the first set of generically chosen linear equations to the line from the second set of generically chosen linear equations and see if they'll span an integral plane. How do we count that? Well, we said that it takes s naught conditions having to be satisfied to make sure that our, our line is an integral. But we also have to satisfy s1 more equations to make sure that the second line we've cut out is uh, uh, going to satisfy all the polar equations from the first line. If the first line is an integral line, then it'll impose S1 equations on another integral line to be compatible with it to make an integral plane. And so what we now have is S0 equations on the first line to be an integral line, and then another S0 plus S1 equations on the second line to fit together with the first one to form an integral plane. And so we have two S0 plus S1 equations that describe integral planes. Okay? So every integral plane near a particular one inside our EP will be uh, cut out by exactly that many equations. And of course, the fact that these S's are remaining uh, constant in, in, some, in some open set is really going to be the, the exactly the, the, the ordinarity condition on EP. Uh, we don't have, find those s's, those characters dropping, so they're they're locally constant. All right, if we repeat this process and we pick some more generic linear equations and so on and so forth, we get more and more of these uh, equations building up by induction. We put them all together. When we've imposed p minus one linear equations generically chosen, and we've done it p times over, we want to construct see if the 
p lines we we constructed that way form all put together a p-dimensional integral element and we can assume by the genericness of the equations we've picked that the that, that they do form a p-dimensional subspace at least near ep does it work out to be a, a, a p-dimensional integral element, that's exactly this many equations. So ordinarity meant we could count numbers of equations and make sure that the count doesn't change nearby. So we don't worry about the characters suddenly dropping or rank uh, on us. So we don't have to worry about those s's. They're staying constant nearby. And as a consequence, we can count. And this is what we end up counting. We find that we get exactly this, dimen this dimension of equations on p-dimensional elements and uh, this many independent equations. And so what we'll finally end up with is, um, is uh, a, a, a manifold of, of, of p-dimensional integral elements with this as its co-dimension. So the p-dimensional integral elements, integral elements will form a manifold um, with exactly this many equations on them. And so that's their co-dimension. Uh, the ps naught plus dot 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 is the co-dimension of that manifold, and it sits inside the Grassmann bundle whose dimension we can count when you work out its coordinates. You can count it, and you'll find, therefore, the dimension of the space of integral elements is exactly this. That's exactly showing that ordinarity is involutivity. On the other hand, showing that involutivity implies ordinarity, you know, it's not difficult. I leave you to check. So, so it shows that one, we've shown one direction. What we've done is in a very geometric way to see why it is that, th that that's exactly the right number of dimensions of the space of integral elements uh, as long as we have some kind of reasonably well-behaved uh, regularity conditions. And, uh, and so that's why we would expect that to be the right dimension. I'll leave you to check that that's exactly the same condition, uh, that ordinary condition is exactly the condition under which the generic uh, integral uh, line lies in an integral plane, generic integral plane lies in an integral threefold, and so on and so forth, all the way up to dimension p. So ordinarity uh, turns out to be exactly the condition of Carton's infinitesimal variant of Carton's strategy working, uh, which is a, clearly a necessary condition for Carton's strategy to work. If Carton's strategy to construct integral manifolds is going to work, then the same strategy applied to integral elements is going to have to work, and therefore we're going to have to work only with ordinary integral elements. But ordinary integral elements uh, sit in, uh, in a manifold of exactly this dimension. So we can see that ordinarity is in exactly in volutivity. So we have a geometric description of the whole story. So putting it all together, ordinarity is in volutivity. Why is that true? We counted the equations. We found that the equations on ordinary integral elements were exactly the right number to be involutive. Now, ordinarity is the intuitive notion that the generic integral line lies in an integral plane and so on up to dimension p. So it has an intu intuitive explanation for why we would expect it to be the right condition. It's exactly the infinitesimal analog of Cartan's strategy to construct integral manifolds. OK, so what we now know is that this is the how we construct uh, integral manifolds, what we need to do is to reconsider the whole theory in terms of tableau, and that's what we'll do next time. We'll try to reconstruct that count, what we just did, instead of uh, counting integral manifolds in some sort of generic, or some sort of um, geometric way, we'll try to do things more algebraically so that we can see how a tableau lays out actual, um, actually, explains to us how to write down explicitly equations for the integral elements. In terms of those equations, we'll be able to see that we can pop out just the right numbers of those equations so that we get exactly the, the co-dimension we expect um, for our integral elements, and that will make it easier in the long run to be able to describe how to construct PDEs and how to prove the Cartan-Kähler theorem.